now pleased to introduce our two guests. I'll introduce them both because they are a road show, a combined road show. <laughs> and they will be alternating back and forth during the presentation. <laughs> so um, over here to my far left is Dr. Steve Hawley, retired professor of physics and astronomy at our beloved KU, former NASA astronaut, a favorite of Cosmosphere audiences, and a former foundation board member and longtime friend of the Cosmosphere. So we really appreciate you being here. And to my near left is Dr. Doug Duncan. He is an eclipse watcher of multiple decades and uh, a friend of uh, Dr. Hawley's from back in graduate school. And um, Dr. Duncan is a noted astronomer, a professor at University of Colorado and the former director of the Fisk Planetarium. So please give a warm welcome to both our guests. And well, good morning, everybody. Uh, one of the first things they taught me way back before I used to talk to groups at my planetarium is get to know your audience and you'll give them a better talk. And so that's kind of how we're going to start today. I want to know how many of you have ever seen a total eclipse, 100%. No kidding, good, good for you. That's half, half of you in the room. Um, gee, what do you say to the other half to explain to them, you know, what they're missing? Um, uh, of those of you who haven't seen a total eclipse, how many of you have seen um, the Grand Canyon? Okay. And of those of you who have seen the Grand Canyon, um, how many of you think seeing a picture of the Grand Canyon is about as good as? No, right? No matter how many pictures of the Grand Canyon you've seen, when you actually see the Grand Canyon, you just stand there, right? And you can't believe how magnificent the Grand Canyon is. Well, it turns out it works that way with eclipses, okay? Um, you can see all the beautiful pictures, and I'll show you some of what it looks like in a total eclipse. But when it actually happens, if you get to see the total eclipse, and you know a lot of people in the room here, you can explain it to the people at your table who haven't seen the total eclipse. It is not just an interesting event, it's an emotional event. It has an incredible impact. It's very eerie, it's strange, it gets cold. Um, as I'm going to prove to you, animals start to do strange things. People start to do strange things. Some people cheer, and I've seen people with tears in their eyes. It's something that you never, ever forget. And so that's why I'm always um, really excited and happy to organize a trip to see a total eclipse. I've been doing that for a pretty long time. And it takes me so long to organize it well. I only do it about twice a decade. But it's coming up uh, in the relatively near future. And we're, we're going to tell you about that. So I said eclipses are rare, total eclipses. And this is a map of total eclipses. Oh, you know, I'll, I'll pass you that. And we can, we can use all, all the stuff. Um, yeah, look how rare. I mean, if you're in North America, in 2017, there was this wonderful total eclipse, and I bet that's the one that many of you got to see, and that's terrific. Uh, in a on April 8th, 2024, there will be another total eclipse. We're pretty fortunate. It is twice as long totality as in 2017. And it's not too remote. It's about an, one of the best places to see it is just north of Austin, Texas. And so already two years ago, um, I did a lot of reconnaissance around Austin. And I reserved uh, two hotels, one of which is smack dab under totality called the Horseshoe Bay Resort. And that's where we're going to be going. And that's where you're all going to be invited to join us. But that's getting a little ahead of myself, OK? But this map proves that it, you're pretty lucky when a total eclipse comes as close to you uh, as will happen in 2024. 
Now, before that happens, in October of 2023, there's going to be a thing called an annular eclipse or a bullseye eclipse. Okay, and, and the reason, uh, this is the map, and you can see that it's going across uh, the southwestern US. And if you were to stay right here in October of 2023, um, about three quarters of the sun is going to be covered from, from right here. So it's a pretty nice eclipse. If you were to travel, to where the maximum eclipse is, you'll see this. So that's kind of a ring of fire or a bullseye annular eclipse. And the reason it looks like this is that the moon's orbit around the Earth is not a perfect circle. You know, but it's close, but it's not exactly. If you, if you look at your tabletops, those are a perfect circle. And if you stretch them just 2% and made them a little bit elongated, that's the actual shape of the moon's orbit. 2% isn't very much, but it means when the moon's a little further away, it looks smaller. And it's such an exact match for the apparent size of the sun and the moon that if you moon, move the moon a little bit further away, it can't completely cover the sun. And that's what happens in an annular eclipse. Okay, so that's happening in October 2023. And then in April of 2024 is a total eclipse. And that's the really fantastic one. And you can see that the path comes out of Mexico and it runs through Texas, it runs all the way uh, up to Canada in the, in the Northeast. Um, however, the weather is a lot worse up in the Northeast and the weather is predicted to be really good uh, in Texas. And so since last I checked, alas, we don't control the weather, um, I decided to organize a trip to uh, Texas for the total eclipse and the cosmosphere is gonna be part of that. And we'll give you some details later on. So um, we decided that we would start by telling you about our own personal experiences in seeing eclipses of the sun. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Steve right now, and he's going to tell you uh, how he got into the eclipse chasing business. And then later on, I'll tell you how I did. Well, thanks. Um, one point, that, oh, thank you. Yeah, that I thought I, I might uh, make, um, Doug didn't mention it when he showed you the map of the uh, eclipse tracks. But if you look at 2017 and 2024, there's one place where the tracks cross. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, how it is extremely rare for there to be a total solar eclipse in the United States. Consecutive total solar eclipses are going to be visible. I think it's from Carbondale, Illinois. <laughs> and that's just, you know, I just find that fascinating that, that nature would conspire to provide a total solar eclipse in the same place, uh, just seven years apart. Yeah, so as Doug, Doug mentioned, um, I want to share a little bit about the first eclipse that I saw. Oops. There we go. This is the ground track of the total solar eclipse that took place in 1979. And uh, you can see, Here's the, the US, of course, and there's the, the track, and it cuts across the north central part of the US. And in 1979, I had been at NASA for about six months, and uh, we had all, all of us that were selected in the first class of shuttle astronauts had just uh, we're still going through our basic training. Uh, a lot of us with no flying experience had just recently checked out in the jet and were now qualified jet crew members. And so three of us came up with an idea, Pinky Nelson, Sally Ride, and me. We were kind of the astronomer contingent within the uh, new astronaut population. And we came up with this harebrained idea that what if we got three pilots and three airplanes, 
and we flew up to Montana and chased the eclipse from 40,000 feet in the, in the jet. And we concocted, well, in fairness to us, this actually was, was legit training in our view because, you know, think about it, you know, first of all, we had to do some significant mission planning. We had to do some coordination with the FAA and the military bases from which we would stage. Um, we were going to, we were proposing to photograph the eclipse from the jet at altitude. And we put together this story about how all of these skills are things we're going to later need, you know, whenever we get assigned to a shuttle mission. And so we did some planning. I think Pinky took the lead for actually calculating the, the path we would have to fly. And we were coordinating with the uh, uh, air traffic control to see if, you know, they would permit that. And at some point we had to put this idea together in some more formal way and take it to management and see if they'd buy it. I was skeptical, frankly, but in the end, they agreed. And so we were permitted to execute this mission. So we got three pilot volunteers, Dick Scobie, Mike Coates, and Hoot Gibson. And we launched off to Montana uh, on February the 25th, 1979. Turns out there's one Air Force base in Montana. It's Malmstrom in uh, Great Falls. And so we flew into there. Uh, and the plan was the next day we would take off and we would fly uh, up to about 43,000 feet and uh, fly the eclipse track. And, and I think the eclipse on the ground was just short of three minutes. And we had calculated that we should be able to get better than five minutes flying at you know, 500 knots at 40 some thousand feet. Uh, and this is actually a slide that I got from an astronomer named Glenn Schneider. Turns out Glenn was doing a talk several years ago on the history of observing eclipses from the air. <clears throat> and I don't know for a fact, but you know, people have been flying for about 60 years in 1979, and I don't know how many total solar eclipses had actually been observed from the air. Uh, so he thought it was interesting to talk about our mission. Uh, that's our airplane. The, you can see a, uh, one of its twins out in the, in the lobby. Uh, and we uh, were successful. Um, and it was, it was it, you know, the, the pilots are flying the plane. I'm in the back seat. I got my Hasselblad. And I'm trying to point it at the uh, eclipse and take some photographs. And, you know, also we're talking to air traffic control and we're trying to make sure we're flying the the route to maximize our ability to make the observations. Uh, that's a picture that I managed to, to take. Um, the one thing that's haunted me over the years is that one of my pilot buddies, Hoot Gibson, had a personal camera with him. We had the flight like Hasselblads and this, you know, again, it's part of the legitimate training that the expedition provided. Uh, but, but Hoot had a personal camera and he was flying along and he just went like that. <laughs> and his picture was almost as good as mine. <laughs> and he has not let me forget that. Um, but uh, so, so I, again, I don't know, but we were probably among the few people that were able to actually photograph a total solar eclipse from the air. Um, and uh, this is, there's a quote here um, back from 1918. And it actually sort of, a, I, you almost could say it applied to our mission. It says, although the flight not undertaken with any serious scientific objectives demonstrated that we may back look to the aviator for work of value in connection with eclipses. We didn't advertise that this was gonna be scientifically valuable. We advertised that it was gonna be valuable training for the activities that we were to engage in later. Um, I guess the last anecdote I would tell you is that we ended up recovering into 
uh, Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota at the end of our uh, chase. And uh, the next day we were gonna fly home. And of course, uh, well, Ellsworth is uh, near Rapid City. And so uh, we decided, well, I wonder if we could talk air traffic control and letting us fly by Mount Rushmore. <laughs> And so we took off and I was talking to air traffic control and I said, hey, you know, any chance that, you know, we could get radar vectors over to Mount Rushmore. And I remember what the controller said. The controller said, Roger, NASA flight, understand you're asking for the Mount Rushmore deviation. <laughs> and I said, okay, I got it. This was not an original request with us. Everybody wants to fly by Mount Rushmore. We had a little bit of unexposed film left. So we got pictures of Mount Rushmore from there. But that was my first experience. And then I got to uh, be with Doug in 2017. And uh, it, it was really interesting how different the experience was. On, in 20, I'm sorry, in 1979, yeah, we, I observed the total solar eclipse, but I was also busy. You know, I was trying to take pictures, I was talking to, you know, air traffic control, trying to make sure that we were still on course. Um, and I almost feel like, you know, if, I almost feel like I missed it. In 2017, we were in Wyoming. The conditions were, I'm not the professional in this, but I would say they were perfect. <laughs> uh, and I had nothing to do except take in the experience. And it was, it really was different. Uh, and, uh, and as Doug had, had said, um, very memorable and both experiences were memorable, but for different reasons. And so, uh, that I will never forget 2017. I don't, I will, I will be there in 2024. And I asked Doug and actually I think Doug didn't know, but I'm going to go research to see whether there was a total solar eclipse visible in the United States between 1951 and, 19, uh, and 1979. Because if there wasn't, then I'll be able to say that I saw all of the total solar eclipses that happened in the United States in my lifetime. <laughs> anyway, so that was my first experience and I'll turn it back to Doug, thanks. Thank you, sir. Is it possible to back up a, a slide. You, oh. Oh, we, one more. Yep. Thanks very much. Well, my first total eclipse was pretty memorable too. It was a lot lower tech than Steve's instead of Instead of a T-38, we had a VW bug. <laughs> and it happened during finals week of my second semester at Cal, second, second term at Caltech. And uh, two astronomy buff friends of mine from the Griffith Planetarium and I, we, we, we thought, wow, it's in Mexico. That's pretty close. I wonder if they give us time off school to go see the total eclipse. So I wrote up a little letter and I sent it to the dean and I crossed my fingers and I'll always be in debt to that dean who said, yeah, take a week off and take your finals when you come back. And uh, I think I told him uh, we were going to photograph an eclipse since that sounded marginally better than we're going to just go gawk at a, at a total eclipse. Anyway, I got permission. We crammed three guys my size into the VW bug and we drove to this little village near Oaxaca, Mexico. It was quite an expedition because none of the three gringos spoke Spanish. So it's amazing we got back. <laughs> we were just joking, right, that Spanish is pretty useful to astronomers because all the big telescopes are down in Chile nowadays. So we should learn Spanish in school, but we hadn't at that time. But nevertheless, we, we made it. And uh, there were three minutes and 20 seconds of totality. And I know that exactly because a lot of people had warned me that it was gonna go fast, really, really fast. It, actually, in my experience, it's kind of like a launch 
Um, once they get to zero and start going, you, you kind of blink and the next thing you know, it's five minutes and there are hundreds of miles downrange. Kind of the same way with a total eclipse, right? It goes really fast. So I'd made a countdown with a tape recorder and I was simply reading time backwards. So three minutes, two minutes, 50 seconds, two minutes, 40 seconds. That's what I recorded. And when totality started, I hit the start button. And my plan, kind of like what Steve said, and this is my advice to people, it's almost impossible to photograph an eclipse and see it, you know? So uh, I really encourage people to have the personal experience of seeing it and maybe get the pictures from the professional and because you just don't have time to do both. But since this was my first eclipse, I knew I wanted to look around the landscape. Uh, we didn't say this, but the reason the eclipse path is, is a stripe on the map, of course, the shadow of the moon is a circle, but the moon is moving and the earth is turning. And so that circle, which is about 100 miles in diameter, typically, that circle sweeps across the map, right? But at any given time, the moon's shadow is a circle. And so when it's total eclipse for you, you're in the middle of a hundred mile circle. But if you're in a place that's nice and clear, uh, you can look all the way around and 50 miles in any direction, the sun is still shining. So you're in the middle of a circular sunrise. And I wanted to see that. So, but then I also wanted to take some pictures <laughs> and I wanted to watch. And the first time I was aware of the tape recording, it was saying 60 seconds left, 50 seconds left. And I hadn't looked at the eclipse yet. I was taking pictures. I thought I'd take three or four pictures and then look. So thank goodness for that countdown. At the end of my first eclipse, I found I'd taken 20 pictures and I had watched it for a little less than a minute. So that you're forewarned, you know, uh, it, it, it's an amazing, but very fast experience. Okay, so now we're gonna go forward, except I'm not going forward. So, oh, I'm moving. Oh, there's a magic code. Oh, okay, good deal. Thank you. We're all nice and centered. And then we can jump ahead. Good. Thank you very much. No problem. So uh, I was so hooked after the March 7, 1970 eclipse that I started chasing them all over the world. And um, more recently, a couple of decades ago, I realized that I could take people with me and we could all really enjoy an eclipse together. And so I've been to 12 total eclipses of the sun. Um, one in uh, Africa that we had to do a safari to get where the eclipse was. One in the Galapagos Islands, that's all those guys in stripes are not prisoners. There's sailors on our boat in the Galapagos. We had a very successful trip in 2006 to the Greek islands and to Egypt saw an eclipse there. You can see we, we got the Sphinx to wear safe eclipse watching glasses. Um, and I started inviting alumni groups of different universities. And so in 2024, KU Alumni Association will be coming on the trip. I'm from University of Colorado. Um, you can see that we got over 100 alumni to come to the trip in 2006. Um, we've chased them in China. That was a pretty fortunate one. It was near Suzhou, China, which is near Shanghai on the coast of China. And unfortunately, even though uh, it was fascinating to visit China and see all different sites, um, it rained for three days solid before the eclipse. And it was predicted to be raining right there on the coast in Shanghai and Suzhou. So uh, I was working with a Chinese partner. We just called up a bus company we said, hey, could we rent three buses for a day? Of course we could. And so we all loaded at midnight onto the bus and headed for a city no one, uh, none of us had ever heard of, Wuhan, China inland, 
was, uh, was predicted to be clear. And so we drove all through the night. The eclipse was at nine in the morning and at eight, we started to break into the clear. And by nine o'clock, we pulled over into the parking lot of a concrete block making factory in some small outskirts of Wuhan and we saw the eclipse. So we were, we were pretty fortunate. Um, alas, it doesn't always work perfectly. Oh, I'm so sorry. I skipped one slide, just one slide backwards. I hit the button twice. So imagine that 100 mile wide shadow of the moon. It's flying across the earth at about 2000 miles an hour, a little less than that, but roughly. Well, it occurred to me one day, there's something else that moves at 2000 miles an hour, the, uh, the Concorde supersonic plane. And I realized if you were trying to watch the eclipse out of the Concorde, if you rendezvoused with the shadow, your entire flight would be a total eclipse out the window. And so I did some legwork and I found a man uh, who had chartered the Concorde before just because he was an aerospace buff and pretty rich. And I pitched the idea to him, hey, why don't you charter it once more and we will rendezvous with a total eclipse. And so we gave that idea to Air France and they loved the idea and they actually flew us to Paris. We met with Concorde operations and the gentleman down there in the lower right, Jean Prunin, he is the chief pilot of the Concorde and an amateur astronomer. So he assigned himself to our flight and was very, very excited about it. And, and we were gonna do it in less than a year. And a week after I got back to the US, the poor Concorde crashed. And that was the plane that we were going to charter and see the eclipse. So no, I have never seen an eclipse from the air like Steve has seen. Okay, so uh, especially for the people in the room who haven't had the chance to go see the total eclipse, what will you see if you go to where the eclipse is total? The thing that fools a lot of people, I would say a majority of people, is the idea that if you've seen 90% of the sun covered, you've seen like 90% of the show. And a lot of you in this room know that is far, far from the truth. A partial eclipse is really interesting, but it has to be a total eclipse to be something just so amazing and, and emotional that you remember it your whole life. And the reason is kind of interesting. The sun is hugely powerful. Um, it turns out that if just 5% of the sun is still visible, so 95% covered, um, it is still... 20,000 full moons. The sun is that bright. So with a partial eclipse, no matter how much of the sun is covered, if it's not 100%, it never gets dark, you don't see all the really good stuff, okay? So what you see if you're in position for a total eclipse is very, very slowly, the moon is covering the sun, it takes maybe an hour, a little more than an hour, the partial eclipse, and then finally, the few precious minutes of the total eclipse, that's when everything changes. Um, this, this happens to be a partial eclipse. And like I said, it's interesting. I put 10,000 people into the Colorado Stadium, and we all watched a partial eclipse. But that is not nearly as good as uh, going to where the eclipse is total. Now, if you want to watch the partial of an eclipse, and if you want to watch the 75% eclipse from here in 2023, by all means, protect your eyes. They make these special eclipse watching glasses. If you don't have them, just make a piece, a, a hole in a piece of paper or cardboard and let the light go through. That's called a pinhole camera. You get a nice little picture um, of, of the um, partially eclipsed sun. Here's an inventive person on one of my trips using the hotel card. You remember some of them have a bunch of holes punched in them. And so she got a whole bunch of little crescent suns. This is cool. Somebody's using a colander to get all of these little partially eclipsed suns. And uh, even if you don't have a colander, sometimes the trees, light just filtering through the trees 
makes hundreds of beautiful little pinhole cameras. And you see the partial eclipse that way. Now, this is something I really, really like. And this was true in, in uh, Wyoming in 2017. Alas, it's not true here. Uh, but uh, the eclipse isn't here. It's down in Texas. Um, with that shadow moving over the landscape at, at several thousand miles an hour, that still takes a few seconds to go each mile. So if you have mountains in the distance, like in Wyoming, we had the Grand Tetons right behind us. If you were watching, just before the eclipse shadow hits you, it hits the mountains, and one by one by one, they vanish. They disappear, very eerie. They're going into shadow, and then a few seconds later, the shadow envelops you. Another really weird thing that is very elusive to see, and you don't see it at all eclipses, uh, a lot of people saw it in 2017, called shadow bands. And just a very light uh, pattern of shadows goes rippling across the landscape just seconds before the total eclipse happens. And then all of a sudden, um, it's totality. And that's when you take off any protective glasses and you just look at the totally eclipsed sun. All around the edge of the sun, you'll see little bright white things. Those are called Bailey's beads after the astronomer Bailey who first described them. And that is the sun sneaking through canyons at the edge of the moon. Okay, if you think about it, the edge of the moon isn't, isn't um, flat, it isn't smooth, it's not like here, it's more like Wyoming. You've got mountains sticking up and in between the mountains you have openings and the sunlight can go through and those are those Bailey's beads. And then what you always hope for are these beautiful reddish prominences which are actually on the sun and there are these enormous regions of hot gas. Um, our sun is always having eruptions. It has the solar wind. Stuff comes off the sun and flies through space and hits the earth. And uh, if you're lucky, because these only last for minutes, um, the sun will have some kind of eruption during the eclipse or a prominence that's just hanging there and not erupting, but it's there and you can see it. And so that's something to look for during totality. I advise during totality to have a pair of binoculars. And during the total eclipse, you watch the sun for half a minute through binoculars. That is the best view I have ever, ever gotten. Obviously, you don't want to use those when it's not the total part of the eclipse. You would go blind. But, you know, uh, in an organized eclipse watching, uh, if you listen to us astronomers, then you're prepared. And once totality starts, you can look for all these different things. And no picture, like we said, does justice to what your eye can see. This is one of the better pictures I've seen, but nothing compares. Your eye is really quite amazing. You know, we can see things at night. We can see things in the bright sunlight. And the uh, corona of the sun, the inner part of it is quite bright. The outer part of it stretches well across the sky and is very faint. And your eye can see all of that. So I think that's why the view is so glorious in person. Um, realize that an eclipse is the only time you can see the corona of the sun. Normally, if you just have a dark filter, you see what's called the photosphere of the sun. So they usually call that the surface, although since the sun is gas, it doesn't really have a surface like the Earth does. But the photosphere is where the sunspots are, and that's what a dark filter lets you see. If you could see x-rays, you would see the same thing that some of our x-ray satellites see. And that's, the, that's what our sun looks like every day. Um, but the only time you can see the sun's outer atmosphere is during the total eclipse. Now, I promised that uh, not only do people enjoy eclipses, so do the animals, okay? And I have about a 30 second video here and I hope I can operate it. In particular, two eclipses that I took people to, the animals did really interesting things. Take a look. Uh, whoops, that did not trigger. I wonder why. 
we're going to have to go back one. I, thanks for the assistance here. We, we've got to trigger that little video. Okay. And then I just have to be very um, careful with my arrow and hit start, right? Yes. Uh oh. <laughs> let's, let's stop for a second. Okay. If you can enable sound, that would be great. I forgot to warn you, didn't I? Um, while she's getting the sound going, I'll tell you uh, which animals to look for. Okay. Um, in the eclipse in Bolivia, uh, llamas. Okay, we're all in the middle of nowhere. That eclipse had no cities near it. So the only thing we could do was camp. So I convinced the REI company to make it a camping trip. We're camped in the middle of Bolivia. We watch and the eclipse becomes total and it was beautiful and everyone's looking up. And, and one lady shouts, look down, look down. Surrounded by llamas. I don't know where they came from. I, I was looking there. <laughs> And, uh, and they watched the eclipse with us. And when it got light after three or four minutes, they got in a line and they marched off into the Andes. Oh, good. I hear it. You just have to make it loud. Okay. Well, I'll narrate it. I know what I said. <laughs> okay. So there we are out in the middle of Bolivia. That's our bus driver. And there's the llamas. They just came out for the total eclipse. Okay, the other eclipse where it was crazy with the animals was in the Galapagos, all right? Um, we were on a little ship and five minutes before totality, every whale and dolphin in the vicinity surfaced and they're just swimming back and forth. And they watched the eclipse with us. It was the darndest thing. Uh, no, but you can stay right here. Okay. Um, I'm going to just narrate this one. It'll work, I think. Um, no, it'll, it'll actually work better. I'll explain why in a minute. Yeah, so all the whales and dolphins, there were 20 of them. And, and they just hung around during totality. And for a few minutes after... I just took a little video camera and I filmed all the whales and the dolphins. And then when it got light, they swam away. And we were in the Galapagos for a week and we never saw them again. I wish I knew what they were thinking. You know, that would have been fun. Well, um, even though no picture and no video and no film can ever capture the majesty and the impact of an eclipse, um, the audio is pretty good, right? I was at one eclipse where I took a bunch of college students to totality. And when totality hit, they were just as impressed as those of you who've gotten to see totality, except their vocabulary was a little different because they were all college students, okay? They didn't say, wow, they used much more colorful language. So this one that we're actually not going to play for you where it says the unedited video, I always have to warn people that it's R rated for language. Okay, I, I've used this video in astronomy classes at the university for 20 years. And I always warn them that if, if you know, colorful language offends you, then come 10 minutes late for the class on Thursday. And that Thursday, I always get 105% attendance. <laughs> they bring their friends. And, and when they first see so totality, there's just a whole chorus of holy cow <laughs> and not cow. So, you know, the, I have just done my best in trying to uh, bring to you what it, it is like to see the total eclipse if you haven't seen it. And there's so many people here who have seen a total eclipse, you know, uh, seek out your friends and ask them, was it worth going to see where the eclipse is total? And I think um, that they're going to tell you yes. One other thing I wanted to finish with, there... Uh, it historically has been very important total eclipses because um, uh, total eclipses are where Einstein's general theory of relativity were first tested and found to work. Nowadays, 
I think everybody has heard of black holes, that space can actually bend. But when Einstein came up with that idea, I think 1916, people thought that was really crazy and out there, you know? And Einstein said that strong gravity will actually cause space to warp or bend. And if you even sent a beam of light, like think of a laser, you know, you send a laser beam that's as straight as you can imagine. And yet Einstein said light would curve because of the curvature of space. And when he said that, besides people thinking he was kind of nuts, um, some smart astronomers figured, hey, we can test that. The biggest mass near us in space is the sun. So if you could observe starlight going past the edge of the sun, according to Einstein, the ray of light, the rays of light would actually bend. And so the position of a star would move in the sky because its light on its way to your eyes would be bent. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that you can't see starlight next to the sun because the sun is so bright. But the astronomers realized that if you looked at the stars near the sun during an eclipse and you took their picture, you could see where the stars were and you could wait three or four months until the sun was in a different part of the sky and then take a picture of those same stars at night and compare it to when they were right apparently next to the sun. And you could see if the positions of the stars moved a little bit when their starlight was going past the sun. And that was the first test of general relativity. And as you can probably guess, Einstein passed. Lights all askew in the heavens, men of science more or less agog. I would imagine women of science were more or less agog as well but they didn't make it into the New York Times. But that was the very first test of the general theory of relativity. And nowadays we realize space can bend so much as to make black holes, but was an eclipse when we learned that. Okay, so uh, I will just end up by telling you that once again, um, I have arranged uh, an eclipse event and have invited a number of universities and a number of museums, including the Cosmosphere, um, to be part of this eclipse event, which is going to take place in Austin, Texas, on April 8, 2024. Um, I'm sure that there will be um, a, a link to the website for the eclipse that we'll arrange um, to be available here at the Cosmosphere. Um, if you are into QR codes and you point your phone at um, this QR code, it'll bring you to the uh, link um, for the eclipse trip. And it has all the details. And um, I always try and make these trips a lot of fun by having terrific speakers. I'm lucky enough that for 11 years, I have been a science commentator on National Public Radio. So I've met a lot of really fascinating speakers and I always write down who are the best and those are the ones I invite. And so there will be five different speakers at this upcoming eclipse. Steve Hawley is one of the speakers and there's four others. And that's what we do during the day. We kind of meet people from all over the world, listen to the speakers. And then Monday morning, there will be almost four and a half minutes of totality. Um, actually, the website for this eclipse, it's called Totality Over Texas. So if you just do a Google search and you type in Totality Over Texas, you're probably going to find the website. Um, I, it actually looks the nicest on a computer screen, but you can also see it on a phone. But I recommend, you know, when you go home, type a search for Totality Over Texas and you can see all the speakers and you can see what's arranged. So the way that it works is you got to get yourself to Austin, Texas, however you want. We meet you there. We meet you at the airport with buses and take people to the hotels. And then the, the speakers happen in the hotels. And the Eclipse watching is on the grounds of a place called Horseshoe Bay Resort. It's a beautiful, uh, it's in the Lake District about an hour north of Austin, Texas. It's really quite a beautiful place. 
and very, very clear skies. It's in a dark sky resort. So it should have, it should have good weather, it should have good viewing, and it should be quite um, an amazing eclipse. And um, the way that I make my trips happen actually is uh, I, I let the alumni associations like KU, like CU know if they decide to come on the trip and the museums. And so if you sign up for the trip, one of the things you have to do in registering is to say, how did I hear about the trip? And then uh, I, when the trip happens, I send commissions to everybody who referred people to the trip. So if you type in Cosmosphere, then the commissions come right here and help support Cosmosphere. Um, and it really is fun to meet all the interesting people, some of whom it'll be their second eclipse or third eclipse, and then a lot of people, it'll be their brand new first eclipse. Um, one last thing. Oh, yeah, question. Thank you. Yes, that's a very good thing to point out. So it doubly be it benefits Cosmosphere and you if you sign up for the trip. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention, it's just kind of fun. Um, you know, I know some of you are kind of technical people and you're kind of interested in a lot of stuff, including inventions. And I always have been fascinated by people who invent this and that. And sometimes I come up with ideas, hey, I could invent this. But then what you need is not only a good idea, but you need a need. Is this something people really need? You know, like a sticky note. Well, maybe we need that. Certainly it's useful. Anyway, the last few eclipses I have been noticing how many people try and take pictures with their phone. In fact, my daughter takes pictures of everything, right? She didn't even go out on a date unless she captures it on their phone. And I realized that um, nobody had invented a way for your phone to take nice pictures of an eclipse. So I did. And um, just this last summer, I, uh, I worked with a programmer and we invented something for anybody's phone to take pictures of an eclipse. It's got one eyed eclipse glass that goes over the camera on your phone and a little piece of Velcro to stick it there and an app that makes it very easy to take pictures uh, of the sun. You know, your phone is really great at taking pictures of people and scenery, but they didn't design it for taking pictures of a, a picture that's all black, except for one bright thing in the middle. So we had to write our own app, but it works really well. That picture in the lower right is one when I first tested it just, uh, just last summer. And those are all pictures I took with my phone at a partial eclipse um, in, in June of last year. So uh, I don't think I've talked to the Cosmosphere people about this yet, but we have just started to produce the solar snap and probably at the store here. You'd be able to get this and put it on your phone. It comes with glasses for you and glasses for your phone and lets you take pictures of an eclipse. First thing I ever invented. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, you know, my last uh, little video, it doesn't have any words, but this is really fun because this only came out about a month ago and probably some of you saw it. This is an eclipse from Mars taken by the Perseverance rover. And you're gonna, you're gonna see how lucky we are on the earth that we have a moon perfectly sized to cover over the sun. It didn't have to be that way, right? The moon is a lot smaller than the sun. It's 400 times smaller than the sun, but the sun is 400 times further away. And so their sizes appear to match and we can get wonderful eclipses. If you were on Mars, Mars has two moons, but they're small and they're, they're not even big enough to, that gravity makes them round. They kind of look like potatoes. And uh, the Perseverance rover about a month ago saw one of Mars's moons eclipse the sun. So I threw this in at the end as a little extra. Watch the kind of eclipse you'd see from Mars. It is not as good as seeing an eclipse from the Earth, but it, it is pretty interesting.
Here we go. Isn't that crazy? Is that wild? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, we will stop there and be happy to answer anybody, everybody's questions. Thank you. All right, let's thank our speakers one more time. I am just so tickled to learn that Mars has potato shaped moons. <laughs> uh, I wanna just really acknowledge how wonderful it is to have our astronaut astronomer duo and to emphasize again that they will be together on the eclipse trip. Uh, they will both be um, your guides for the experience and the science of the experience. And um, as uh, Mimi Meredith mentioned, we do have a member discount for the trip. Members, current members receive $100 off. You can join just to start receiving that benefit and our other exciting member benefits. You don't have to have been a longtime member. You can join today and receive that benefit. Um, the code for registering with a discount is available from our membership coordinator, Sheila Harmony, so that her email is Sheila H at Cosmo.org. We'll put this info um, on our website and on our social as well. And the eclipse trip, you can find more info at bit.ly slash eclipse trip 2024. We will put that on our channels online as well. So I wanted to make sure you were aware of all that. Um, our distinguished guests do have a tour with Jim Remar scheduled for 10 a.m. So unfortunately, I'm just gonna take one question from our guests who are on live stream and one question from our guests who are here in person. And then you may have a chance to quickly come up and say hello with our guests that then they do need to head out on their Cosmosphere tour. This is Dr. Duncan's first time in the Cosmosphere. So I really appreciate all of you being here. Let's start with our live stream guests. Oh, okay, no questions. Oh, you get two live audience, <laughs> all right. <laughs> All right, so are there any questions from the live audience? And maybe you are full of your info and digesting your info and your pastries. Yes. <laughs> how far in advance, I'm gonna repeat for our live stream audience, how far in advance can a, an eclipse be predicted? Nowadays, thousands of years. So we actually have a catalog that lists all the eclipses for several thousand years. Isn't that great? All right. One more. That's an important question. How much damage could be done to your eyes if you're not wearing the eclipse glasses, which Dr. Duncan is selling? <laughs> You know, I'm really glad you asked that question because um, I always feel sorry when we read these stories, and there are lots and lots of them, of principals and administrators who say, keep all the kids inside on Eclipse Day and like, don't let them get hurt. And they miss this awesome opportunity to get really, really interested. Look, on Eclipse Day, the sun is the same sun is not on eclipse day. The only difference is you have a temptation to want to look. Now, as I showed you, the sun is so powerful that even if you cover half of it or cover three quarters of it, it's just as dangerous as the sun on any day. But you don't hear about people getting their eyes injured by the sun every day. Why is that? If you accidentally look at the sun, you know, suppose you get out of your car and you, and you accidentally look right at the sun, what happens? You turn away you know, in probably half of a second or a second, you turn away. If you've just looked at the sun for a second or two, it's going to be like a flashbulb or something went off and it's going to bother you for minutes, but then it's going to fade away and you're going to be fine. So the only time that I have seen people hurt, and it's a very, very small number of people, but there have been a handful of people who 
believe it or not, just stared at the sun for minutes. And those are the people who are hurt their eyes. Honestly, out of millions and millions of people in the US, there's only a handful who have ever done that. And at least some of them were, how should I put this? They were not sober <laughs> when they did it. So that could get you into trouble, but, but you're not gonna just accidentally you know, hurt your eyes. So I'm, I'm really glad you asked that. I've been asked to make a video for school principals explaining the answer to your question. Because it's so sad when all the kids get kept inside when either with pinhole cameras or the, with Eclipse watching glasses that could have a cool science e experience. It, I, I was never in a school where there was an Eclipse we could see. I, yeah, but now people will. We squeak one, yeah. Yeah, um, he asked, is it similar to watching like an arc welding? And, and the answer is yes. Anything with an intense bright light, you don't wanna keep staring at it. And it looks like we did have one from online. What's an example of what some of our ancestors thought of eclipses? This will be an interesting one. And this will be our last question. Thanks again to all of you for joining us online and in person. They were scared. Because I, I really do think it looks like the end of the world. Not only are you consciously scared during an eclipse, but I think you have some really deep emotional feelings come out. You know, the way I, I tell myself this is true is only twice in my life have I had the hair on the back of my neck just stand up. Now, I don't know if you've had this experience, but you always read like if you're really, really scared, the hair on your neck is going to stand up. And during a total eclipse that happens to me, and one time I was hiking in the Everglades and I came around a corner and from here to that side wall, there was a mountain lion. I guess they call them pumas down there. And I didn't even have to consciously think, oh, this is bad. <laughs> Instantly, the hair on the back of my neck went up because somewhere deep in my brain, something was saying, this is not good. And I find when there's a black hole where the sun should be in an otherwise clear sky, there is some part of my brain saying, this is not right. I hope those astronomers are correct because <laughs> otherwise it's what the last few minutes of, of the whole world would, would, would look like. And so that's my answer to how that works.